from the adventures of R2-D2 and C-3PO comes the remarkable tale. Star Wars, Episode 1, Battle for the Republic. Prologue. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Peace reigned under the democratic rule of the Galactic Republic. A remarkable circumstance, which only came to exist through the wise and selfless bravery of Jedi Master Yoda and his legendary Jedi Knights. The Jedi were the defenders of justice and the sworn protectors of the galaxy. Revered for their extraordinary abilities to use a mystical, mighty energy known as the Force, it was from this power that the galaxy could live in freedom. Unfortunately, this peace would not last forever, for even the most powerful of Jedi could not stop greed and corruption, from seeping into the very heart of the Republic, the Senate. And eventually the Senate saw it beneficial to institute an army of the Republic. A droid army, that, it was believed, would protect the galaxy should the Jedi fail. Disputes and protests followed. But when a corporate-funded military force, known as the Imperial Regime, began to use new cloning technology to strike out against the Republic, the Senate responded by simply ignoring the Jedi and set about unleashing its droid army. They argued that victory would be achieved, without any cost of life. Many dissatisfied senators were adamant that the conflict would only escalate unless the Jedi became involved. And when word broke out of a Jedi Knight, almost being persecuted in his lone crusade to uncover and expose the truth, Senators Bail Organa and Padme Amidala decided to seek out the fugitive, the once highly regarded Obi-Wan Kenobi. They thought he could be a vital key in making the Senate see the true merit of the Jedi Knighthood, to finally quench the need for war and put an end to the corruption. From the First Saga. Journal of the Wills. Chapter 1. In an almost desolate part of the galaxy, shadowed away from the Galactic Republic's governing center, a small unobtrusive transport cruised the Outer Rim territory, toward the desert planet of Tatooine. The ship had obviously seen better days. Its passengers were nestled among an unkempt interior of decay and filth, while its engines strained from years of neglect. The fact it had survived burnout was a miracle. To the casual traveler it would seem like madness stepping aboard such a transport, but the planet's public shipping route had been abandoned years ago. There was nothing else. Which was why, only but the hardiest, wretched of creatures chose to come to the outer rim. Looking through a side window Bail Organa and Padme Amidala watched on in wonder as the desert hues of Tatooine radiated from the light of the system's twin suns. The two senators had never set foot on this part of space before. They were more used to the decadence of high political diplomacy and as such had their reservations. It wasn't long before the transport was rummaging through Tatooine's dry atmosphere, as it descended upon its destination. Shortly thereafter the craft opened its landing gear and followed normal protocol for their arrival at Mos Eisley spaceport. The ship was soon safely touching down at docking bay 9. Finally, after many days of traveling, the transport's entrance ramp opened. Bale, Padme and their trusty R2 unit strode onto the dusty ground. Taking a glance at their surroundings, it was clear this place was not the domain for two such wealthy, high-profile senators. Roaming around in such a harsh landscape, filled with many of the galaxy's most dubious inhabitants seemed like asking for trouble. But Bail Organa and Padme Amidala had discarded the usual delicate, diplomatic attire for more suitable items of clothing. Well we made it, observed Padme. Yes, acknowledged Bail, as he steered off into the distance. Let's hope this isn't going to be a wasted trip. As they stood momentarily, trying to get their bearings, their little droid activated an antenna from the top of his domed head. You sense anything interesting, R2? asked Padme. 
the droid rotated its head from side to side, responding in electronic high-pitched squeals. Padme interpreted, he says there's something over in that direction, well R2 I guess you'd better show us the way. Soon the cautious travelers were walking amongst a large marketplace. It seemed the alley was completely devoid of any bustling crowds. And judging by the closing stalls and leftovers, the market was nearly due to finish its day of trade. Regardless R2-D2 strolled forward, for what appeared to be, a junk shop. You're sure about this place R2? Padme asked upon arrival. Curious, as she touched one of the many items on sale, it all looks like junk to me. Hearing the word junk alerted the storekeeper to their presence, and from out of nowhere a long-snouted blue alien appeared. Mom that may look like junk to you, but I can assure you that is a valuable piece of engineering. Said the storekeeper. And as he flapped his wings and wriggled his nose the toy Darian prepared himself to try and bargain. I'm sorry. I didn't mean. The toy Darian took no notice, he glanced at R2 and continued. You wanting to buy or sell? I could make you a very good offer for that droid, I don't see too many of them. We are not looking to sell, Bale said with confidence. But if you have got a form of transportation, that could be, say, reliably commandeered. We might be interested. What do you think this is? Some sort of shipyard. Spat the storekeeper. He looked at them both and thought for a moment. I'm guessing you're here for the Boonta Eve classic. Boonta Eve. The toy Darian laughed. It was pretty obvious to him that these customers were not locals. Probably not even from the same planet. It's the most rigid racing event this side of the Outer Rim Territory. Explained the alien. Not a good time for traveling I'm afraid, I hope you brought plenty of money, eh? To the little band of explorers, it was disappointing, and with a gestured nudge they began to move on. Padme looked at the alien, somewhat apologetically. Sorry, she said back. Wait on, called the toy Darian. Wait one quick parsec, you haven't told me where you are going yet. I thought you told us this wasn't a shipyard. A slip of the tongue my friends, pure slip of the tongue. Said the toy Darian. You know, maybe, for a few generous credits, I could get you to your destination. Bale looked at the alien with some hesitation, but he knew if they could have the company of a local to help them, it would make things easier. And I can promise you this, you won't be finding yourself a speeder going anywhere in that direction. Continued the alien. Really, a tempting offer. Bale replied. But we're not going somewhere in specific, we're just trying to find someone. What? Out here? Questioned the toy Darian. Well I'm not a bounty hunter, though, I guess you may find them at Boonta Eve. A lot of people there, ah. You bet. Anybody and everybody from this quadrant of Tatooine. Explained the toy Darian. It's a good opportunity to make a few nice credits too. The toy Darian took the senators through to his large storage room, out the back. It was, in the eyes of Bale and Padme, full of worthless scrap. But to the trained eye, beneath all the dust and dirt, were mounds of well-preserved parts. Thanks in large to the dry heat. Padme observed several old droids mulling around working amongst the stock. Then she looked over at a large sign on one of the walls. It read Watto's Junk Shop. I take it you're Watto. Hum, oh yes, muttered the storekeeper with a laugh. I started this place a long time ago. I'm Padme and this is Bail and Artu. Very nice I'm sure. The storekeeper flew to one corner and threw off several pieces of stock that were sat on top of a bundle of canvas. I was thinking of restoring this for myself, the toy Darian explained to the senators, as they came closer. And okay she's not the prettiest of speeders, I'll give you that. 
but she goes like a rocket. The shopkeeper pulled away the canvas to revel an old, sad, beaten-up, open-top, four-seater landspeeder. Padme's eyes became as large as Tatooine's son's. You're expecting to take us in that thing? She asked frightfully. It looks like a death trap. The shopkeeper replied with a sniggering laugh that vibrated at the knowledge that there was nothing else for miles and miles around. Lady I promised you transport, I didn't say it'd be luxury. Chapter 2 The smoking speeder ripped across the Tatooine landscape. R2-D2 had shut himself down, in the back, as the ripples from the shaky motor plagued his equipment. As for the others they were not quite as lucky, the rough ride battered their nerves as they endured the strong winds that blew around their faces. Then, with the scolding heat of the sun, the speeder's engine finally blew out of exhaustion. Without hesitation Watto flew to the front of the speeder, opened up the hood and smoke bellowed out furiously. He waved his arm across the engine to try and dispel the fumes. How is it? Padme asked fearing the worst. Well, Watto started slowly. She's overheated. Not good I'm afraid. Can you fix it? Padme asked wondering. Let's say we won't be going anywhere, at least for a while. Great, just great. Bale said thinking something had to go wrong. We paid you half your money and now you've got us stuck in this horrible wretched place. What? You think I deliberately ripped you off? I wouldn't be surprised. Watto let go of the speeder's hood as his temper grew. Why you ungrateful off-world know it all, I'll. Hey, hey, said Padme to defuse the rising tension. Let's not get ourselves worked up over this little unforeseen circumstance. Things will be all right. We'll just have to wait that's all. And wait they did. Before them, Tatooine's twin sons began their descent for the creation of a beautiful sunset. And as each of them stared upon the reddish hue of Tattoo One, it gave Bale the thought that maybe adventure was not meant for senators of the Republic. Maybe the galaxy might have been better served if they hadn't undertaken this journey. Not long afterwards Watto finished tending to the speeder's engine. He knew the desert was a dangerous place to be, especially during the cooler temperatures of the night. This friend of yours must be quite something, eh? Watto said to Bale while getting some water. What do you mean? Living out here, it's not the kind of place for anyone who wants an easy life. Explained Watto. It's mostly for those of us who'd rather live without the prying eyes of the Republic. Bale watched on as Watto filled the engine. You don't wish you weren't so hidden away out here. Watto chuckled a laugh. No. And I doubt either will your friend, he may be impossible to find I think. Not if he finds us first. Watto looked back at Bail Organa, somewhat confused by his comment, and then closed the hood of the landspeeder. They were ready to continue on. Late the next morning, the weary travelers finally arrived at Mos Espa. Watto's landspeeder rumbled past all the hordes of colorful creatures that littered its pathways. There was certainly a buzz in the air, the city was crowded, and it was a perfect day for racing. Soon after Watto found a spot where everybody could get out of the vehicle and hear the sound of commentary among the chatter of bustling racing fans. See what did I tell you, said Watto proudly. People are everywhere. We are in your debt, thank you. Bail Organa replied as Watto flew to his side. Yes debt, don't forget our agreement now. Watto said rubbing his hands together. You still owe me some credits. Indeed, Bail acknowledged. He then looked over to Padme. As Padme hustled one of the local vendors for tickets, Bail Organa stood watching all the strange inhabitants rummaging around, chatting excitedly about the race. He hoped he might just glimpse Obi-Wan Kenobi. Soon Padme had arrived back. Where's Watto? She asked. 
oh, he's gone off to place a bet, using the money I gave him on an entrant called Skywalker. Any luck with Kenobi? I'm afraid not, said Bale frankly. It seems the odds aren't in our favor. Chapter 3 Inside an enormous stadium Bale and Padme moved to find their spots. The bustle of the crowd erupted as the podraces were pulled into position, next to their flag bearers. As Bale came to their seats he found a familiar face. Are you made it, greeted Watto. Quite a coincidence, eh? You must have bought your ticket from the same vendor. Did you place your bet on Skywalker? Bale replied, as he sat toward the millions of spectators in the grandstand. Yes, keep an eye for that blue one near the front, that's Skywalker. Watto explained. He's a relative newcomer, but he's got talent, a sure winner. Bale instantly dismissed Watto's comment. It was something he'd heard from gamblers so many times before. From speakers all across the stadium, commentators introduced the drivers as they entered their pod races. Before they knew it they were asked to start their engines. Soon came the countdown and the starting light flashed green. Skywalker shoved the control levers, hoping to establish a good position from the very beginning. The podracer leaped forward, and the engines coughed and died. Frantically, Skywalker worked the controls as Podracer after Podracer swerved around him and vanished into the desert. Finally, he saw the problem. The fuel regulator had been manually adjusted to full open, and the engines had flooded. How did that happen? He lost more precious seconds waiting for the extra fuel to evaporate and the engines to start again. At last, they ignited. Without waiting to see if the engines would keep running, Skywalker sent his podracer screaming after the pack. As he rounded the first turn, he glimpsed a smoking fireball smeared across the base of a rock formation. Somebody swung too wide and crashed. He sped easily through the series of stone arches, without other podraces getting in his way, they were simple. The trailing podraces came into view ahead of him. I'm catching them. Again, he worked the controls, feeding power first to one engine, then the other. The podracer swept around the other stragglers, one after another. If he could get out of this bunch, he could really catch up. A podracer just ahead of him slid sideways, blocking him. Skywalker veered to the opposite side, but the other driver seemed to expect it, and cut him off again, and again. There was a drop coming up. He pulled back, leaving an extra length between his podracer and the one that blocked him. Then, just as the other driver went over the drop, Skywalker shoved both engine controls full open. The podracer surged forward. It flew off the edge of the cliff and over the blocking racer, barely missing the other driver's engines. The pod came down with a jolt that rattled, but a quick check showed all the warning lights still shining green. It worked. At the canyon dune turn, he saw another wreck ahead of him. Some instinct made him veer to one side, though he was nowhere close to the burning pod racer. An instant later, a shot bounced off the rear of his pod. Tuscan Raiders he sped up unevenly, trying to make the podracer a hard target to hit. He must have been successful, no more shots struck his pod while he was still within range. The next few races were strung out along the course. Getting by them was easy, just a matter of speeding up on the turns. Soon Skywalker was past all of the stragglers. The grandstand flashed by as he came up on the central pack of races. Two laps to go. It took him most of the second lap to work his way through the pack. Finally, he came within sight of the leading podraces. There were only five podraces ahead of him now. Skywalker sped up. And rounded the next corner, right into an enormous cloud of dust. Somebody else crashed. 
he swung wide, hoping to avoid hitting any of the pieces of the smashed racer. One of them hit the podracer anyway, setting it swinging. Skywalker barely compensated in time. As he came out of the dust cloud, Skywalker saw that he'd passed three others. The only racer left ahead of him was the leader, Sebulba. There was no mistaking the odd shape of those engines. Leaning forward, Skywalker gunned his engines. As the grandstand flashed by for the second time, he came up even with Sebulba. One more lap, just one. Engine to engine, they raced over the rocky course. A flap opened on the side of Sebulba's near engine, sending a stream of hot exhaust straight at Skywalker's engine. So that's why those other pod races crashed. Sebulba melted holes in their engines. Skywalker pulled back just in time. Furious at Sebulba's maneuver, he whipped to the inside on the next tight corner and took the lead. Keeping the lead was harder than taking it had been. Sebulba stayed on Skywalker's tail, pushing him on every turn. Skywalker clung grimly to his hard-won position. It was the last lap. Out of nowhere something went wrong. The left engine. The main inertial compensator was shaking loose. Rapidly, Skywalker adjusted the controls to use the backup system, but he wasn't quite fast enough. While he was changing over, Sebulba passed him. Skywalker wasn't prepared to concede just yet. But every move he made, Sebulba blocked him. And there were no more convenient drop-offs coming up, Skywalker wouldn't be able to play the same trick he'd used on that other driver early in the race. Something else, then. As they came around the final turn, Skywalker pretended to dodge to the inside. It was the same maneuver he had used to pass Sebulba the first time. But when Sebulba dodged to block him, Skywalker swung wide, trying to pass on the outside. He did not quite make it all the way around Sebulba's podracer. Side by side, they headed toward the finish line. Sebulba swerved, deliberately slamming his pod into Skywalker's. He swerved again, and his steering rods became tangled with Skywalker's. Skywalker fought for control. He saw Sebulba laughing as the finish line drew closer and closer. He tried to unlock the steering rods by pulling away from Sebulba's podracer, but they were too tightly caught. And then Skywalker's steering rod broke under the strain. The podracer began to spin. Grimly, Skywalker hung on to the power controls. No steering, no stability. But he could still change the engine's speed. By instinct and feel, he kept the podracer on course, heading for the finish line through the cloud of smoke and flame. Smoke and flame. Sebulba crashed. Skywalker crossed the finish line and brought the podracer to a halt. As Skywalker's engines died, cheers littered the entire grandstand, and no more so was an ecstatic Watto. He flew up and punched the sky with his fist. I told you he'd win. The boy is extraordinary, no one starts last and wins the race, no one but Skywalker. Both Bail Organa and Padme Amidala looked on in amazement. It dawned on them that the driver's abilities were indeed extraordinary, almost too extraordinary. It was, as if, he could have been a Jedi with those reflexes and maneuvers. Was he the Jedi Knight they were after? Could he indeed be Obi-Wan Kenobi? It was a while before the crowds had left, and the red hues of an evening sunset poured upon an empty quiet grandstand. In one of the pits the young man, known as Skywalker, was busy attaching his dependable podracer to a much smaller speeder. Skywalker then turned his head as he heard the whistle of a droid. And saw its masters walking behind. After missing the race R2-D2 was excited to meet the winner. Bale and Padme were even more curious to find out just who exactly the man was. Congratulations, said Bale upon approach. 
As Skywalker turned to greet them it was clear he was not Kenobi. It was a fantastic victory. Padme added. I hope you don't mind our intrusion. No, Skywalker said happily, everyone's been saying, today was one for the history books. Me, I'm just glad the old girl here managed to bring me back in one piece. I mean some of those crashes were pretty spectacular. I'll say, I've never witnessed pod racing quite like this. This is outer rim racing, replied Skywalker. It's all about winning at any cost. I can well believe it, added Bale. By the way I'm Bale Organa, this is Padme Amidala and this is our droid R2-D2. In his robotic language R2 messaged hello and Padme smiled. A pleasure, Skywalker responded. I guess you already know who I am, but call me Anakin. Well, Anakin, said Padme, we're new to this system and traveled a great distance. I thought so, Anakin interjected. You don't really look like locals. You must be really dedicated racing fans to come all this way. Not quite, honestly, we're here hoping to find a friend of ours. Padme answered. His name is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Bale added. And from what we were told, he lives somewhere out beyond the Dune Sea. Way, way out there. Anakin replied surprised. Well I've never heard of an Obi-Wan Kenobi. And to be honest if he went out there, chances are, you may not find him alive. Bale and Padme grimaced at the very thought of their friend being long gone. They knew that even a Jedi Knight could be killed, even one as powerful as Obi-Wan Kenobi. Look I'll tell you what I'll do. Anakin continued. I'm about to go and visit my mother. She lives not too far away, from where you're all heading. You can see her. If anybody is likely to know of your friend's whereabouts, she will. Chapter 4 Anakin Skywalker's speeder moved like lightning, along the desert terrain, with his pod racer in tow. R2-D2 was packaged up and hung to the side of the vehicle in rope netting. He twisted his head nervously, as he was not fond of being treated like inexpensive luggage. Padme sat next to Anakin, and Bale sat in the single spare space, in the front passenger seat. It wasn't that long before they arrived at a remote homestead. The moisture farm was as desolate and dry as anywhere else on Tatooine. Bail Organa and Padme Amidala simply couldn't help but wonder why anyone would try and farm in such a place. Mom, Anakin yelled out as he and the others unloaded themselves from the speeder. Anybody home? Anakin led Bail and Padme onwards towards the farmhouse. Mother. Suddenly his mother appeared with a welcoming smile. Anakin, she breathed. I didn't know you were coming today. Look at me, you've caught me in my work rags, I'm hardly presentable. Anakin warmly patted his mother on the back and hugged. You look fine mom, don't worry about it. Anakin said reassuringly. I have some people I brought you to meet. Yes, I see. Anakin's mother moved her attention to Bale and Padme. Mom this is Bail Organa and Padme Amidala, Anakin said introducing them as they greeted his mother. I met them at the Buta Eve Classic. My name is Shmi, nice to meet you. Shmi said as she warmly shook Bail and Padme's hands. You too, they greeted back. They are trying to find a man called Obi-Wan Kenobi. Have you heard of him? It's not familiar, Shmi said with a thought. Clyeg might know, when he gets back from tinkering around with that moisture evaporator, I will ask him. Is that thing still having problems? I guess so, replied Shmi with a slight laugh. Anyway, come in, come in, let's get you out of this blaring heat. Inside the homestead Shmi Lars prepared some light food and cool refreshments for her guests and served them. I'm sorry, said Shmi, if I'd known you were coming I'd have something more plentiful than these Joella rolls. 
after our long journey, replied Bail Organa. This is just perfect. Shmi smiled as she sat herself down. Please, don't be shy. Shmi your son is an exceptional driver. Padme said as she filled her drinking glass with water. The way he blitzed the opposition, you'd hardly guess he was so young. I know, Shmi responded. But I can't watch it. I almost die at the thought of seeing him in an accident. Anakin could empathize with his mother. Pod racing was, after all, a very dangerous sport that endured a great many casualties. Next season one hope I'll be able to go professional. Anakin explained. Travel from planet to planet and race in the gold level galactic circuit. You can't wait to leave and start pursuing your dream. Asked Bale as he was about to eat a Joella roll. You bet ya, yeah. Anakin replied. Why would anyone want to stay here when there's a whole galaxy to explore? Before anyone could talk further Anakin's stepfather, a tall, rugged man, entered as he put away his wide-brimmed hat. Ah here he is, Shmi called towards him. Plyek there are two people here needing your assistance. Plyek looked towards them, not sure what to make of them. Oh, Plyek responded. This is Bail and Padme. Shmi continued. They are trying to find someone named Obi-Wan. Nice to meet you both, Klyag replied. Sorry I'd shake your hands, but mine are filthy. That's okay. I see you've met Anakin. Klyag observed. Owen is hiding around here somewhere, so you're after this Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan Kenobi, Bail Organa added. We think he might have moved somewhere out beyond the Dune Sea. Glad to take some weight off his legs, Klyag Lars pulled up the remaining chair and sat down. The only rumor I've heard is of a peculiar man wanting to live out amongst the wasteland. I don't know if that's the man you're looking for, but to live out there he must be a nut. Said Klyag coming straight to the point. Don't be surprised if you find him dead, because if the sand people haven't got to him yet, the severe isolation has. We must find him, Padme Amidala stated. It's important we do. He, he's our friend. He must be if you're willing to risk all the dangers out there. Klyag Lars said sternly. I'll escort them, Anakin unexpectedly blurted out. I'll take them there. You'll do no such thing Anakin. Shmi said in a lively response. Hey look, these guys won't get far unless someone goes with them. I know the area, Anakin said thinking rationally. Otherwise they'll probably be lucky to survive the night. Shmi Lars couldn't fault her son's selfless act of kindness. But the whole idea of Anakin traveling into the Jundland wastes frightened her. He was Shmi's eldest son and no matter what the circumstance was, she couldn't endorse Anakin's decision. Though, still, she had to recognize Anakin was no longer the little boy that Shmi could protect from harm, from his idealistic cravings for adventure. She had no choice but to let him go. I can't stop you Anakin. But if you must go, promise me you will stay away from the first sign of any danger. Don't worry, I will. The next morning Shmi watched as Anakin Skywalker, Bail Organa and Padme Amidala fled off into the distance. She waved goodbye as Klyak comforted her, with Owen standing beside them. Shmi looked on in hope that everything was going to be all right. You okay R2? Bail asked the droid, who had been placed into a new position at the back of the speeder. A small screen, centered in the middle of the front dashboard, became engulfed with lines of text. A message from R2-D2 that indicated he was indeed fine. Good. From here on in keep your scanner handy. Bale replied. If you get a signal that could be human, let us know. Another message lit the screen. Thanks, R2. It was a lot further into the journey that R2-D2 finally received a strong signal. 
for the most part the droid had only been detecting the faint signals of native reptilian creatures. Anakin then took the plot points that were given to him by R2 and adjusted the speeder's course accordingly. Soon they entered a remote mountainous region. Anakin didn't like it, not one bit. The place echoed danger, and sensed their presence wasn't going unnoticed. When the party came to a more open spot among the cliff faces Anakin decided to park his speeder. Shall we go in and see if we can't find out what this thing is? It wasn't a long trip to where they were able to identify a cave entrance. But the trail was unsteady and not the easiest thing to pass through. Bale, Padme and Anakin found a spot to lie down and bring out a pair of macro binoculars. Well something's going on in there. Bale Organa said, not really understanding what he was seeing. Bale passed the macro binoculars over. Padme took them and saw into the viewer. I can see a figure of some sort, something's out there. All of a sudden, a scream was heard. Padme tried to focus the macro binoculars towards its source. But it was impossible to distinguish anything among the shadows. She lowered the macro binoculars from her eyes. Without warning a bone flew out from the entrance, as if it had been spat out in annoyance, and landed very near Anakin's side. Maybe it's time for us to move on. Padme suggested while offering back the macro binoculars. I think Padme might have a point, said Anakin while trying to remain calm. Yeah let's go, Bale replied without any argument. As they started to move a shadow cast over them from behind. When Padme, Bale and Anakin lifted their eyes, there in front of them was a gigantic lizard staring down at them. Holy mackerel, it's a crate dragon. Anakin cried in horror. Run. The crate dragon attacked the group with a snap of its mouth. Everybody just managed to scatter as the beast's sharp claw like teeth tried to grab them. With no plan or time to think or react rationally, they all panicked and fled. As they ran the crate dragon instantly decided upon the one member who seemed the most vulnerable of the group. And so the dragon set its sights towards poor Padme. Padme did everything she could, she swerved, and ducked amongst the terrain but the crate dragon stuck with her as it roughed up the ground leaping forward. Bail Organa and Anakin Skywalker both got to the land speeder and took off with a hope they might be able to save Padme. It was a tentative time though, in as much as they wanted to be heroes, the dragon could very easily destroy them with a quick swipe of its tail or a brush from one of its legs. But they had to try. Padme Amidala moved forward with little idea of where she was going. The crate dragon knew that if it abided its time and kept with her, an opportunity would eventually present itself to strike. It would soon have a fresh morsel of food to eat. As Padme's legs tried to cope with all the embedded stones that encompassed the ground beneath her, she felt she wasn't traveling fast enough. She pushed herself to go quicker. Padme was in such a state of panic she wasn't even yelling for help, and then, by the next breath, Padme tripped. Before she knew it her balance had disappeared, as she failed to notice a large stone. Finally, as Padme turned herself around, her face became covered by terror as the crate dragon again entered her sight. It looked directly at her, almost relishing that it was about to collect its prize. Padme screamed. Anakin Skywalker and Bail Organa saw everything as they headed towards the area. Hang on Padme, Anakin yelled. Then Bail and Anakin's heart stopped as the crate dragon jumped for her. And in that moment of shared devastation the unbelievable happened. As they rode on they watched the dragon freeze motionless in mid-air, meters above Padme's body. Anakin stopped the landspeeder close by. What the, Bale said trying to comprehend what was going on. Anakin Skywalker ran to Padme's side and quickly assessed her condition. Are you okay? 
in a bad state of shock, Padme grimaced. My foot, she said. We've got to get you up. Anakin replied. Bail came and supported her as Padme moved her torso forward. Then they all watched in amazement as the crate dragon shifted across the sky and a new voice spoke attracting their attention. Did I get to it in time? said a cloaked man walking towards them. You did. Anakin responded trying to make out the hidden face. The figure came close and pulled back his hood. Obi-Wan, Bail Organa said with an underlining tone of excitement. Now what on Tatooine's barren desert brings out a husky senator and these two weary travelers? Obi-Wan Kenobi inquired. Anyway, it's nice you made the trip. I'm glad you're here. Anakin looked at Obi-Wan Kenobi in puzzlement, you're, you're the one responsible for saving Padme. Yes, Obi-Wan said not paying much importance to the question. He bent down and observed Padme, like a doctor attending its patient. I can feel you've had quite a tumble. Padme, in throbbing pain, nodded and tried to spit out the words she wanted to say. But could only utter four words, it, 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 hurts. Obi-Wan Kenobi used his hand to follow the stream of pain from her thigh, right on down to her ankle and then closed his eyes. The fingers of his hand slowly waved above the source of her pain. Then he reopened his eyes. Almost in an instant the pain vanished and Obi-Wan offered his hand. Padme took it and stood up. I, I don't believe it. She said. I'm afraid as good as it feels, it is not a cure, Obi-Wan promptly advised. But with a little rest, you will be soon back on your feet. Chapter 5 In Obi-Wan Kenobi's small dwelling, the group took a well-deserved rest. The night soon fell, and a bright new morning awaited them the next day. Anakin Skywalker took in a fresh glass of water as he entered a room where Padme Amidala was sleeping. Padme, tired but awake, pulled herself up to sit on the bed and smiled. Thank you, she said as she grabbed the glass. Padme looked at Anakin's face and saw the obvious glumness. You okay? Something wrong? Heroic blues I guess, he replied. I should have saved you. Padme empathized with what he was feeling. Don't worry, it all worked out in the end. Not everything goes to plan. I know, I know. Anakin said acknowledging she was, of course, correct. But if it hadn't, if Obi-Wan Kenobi hadn't been there when he was, you would have died. Well yes. And that's something I couldn't live with. I'd be haunted by it for the rest of my life. Anakin, said Padme more seriously. I know what it is that you're saying. But life doesn't always unfold the way you want it to. Your intention was good, and you are a good man. Don't beat yourself up over the negative aspects of what happened. Take comfort in the fact you know you did the right thing. I mean not even a Jedi Knight can control the passing of time, they can't control everything. Padme's words did soothe Anakin's anxiety. And he certainly couldn't disagree with her. But inside he still felt a sense of failure. Obi-Wan Kenobi was kneeling with a rag in hand, dusting a rather filthy R2-D2. Good morning, he said to Padme as she wandered into the main quarters of Obi-Wan's abode. How are you feeling today? Much better, thank you. Bail Organa, who was preparing food, walked over to see Padme. Would you like something to eat? No, no, she said. I'm fine, really. I'm afraid your little friend here has seen better days, Obi-Wan Kenobi explained. Though with a lubrication bath, he'll be all right. He then moved himself to a chair to wipe off the remaining elements of dirt from R2 and continued. So, tell me what brings you two all this way. We need your help Obi-Wan. Padme answered. 
You know of the growing corruption, the impending war, said Bail Organa. We believe we can prevent it. You know I hold to the same ideals as you do, Obi-Wan replied. I tried to expose the real reason for the creation of the Republic's droid army. But I was seen as meddling and became a very much unwanted threat. So now I am considered an enemy of the Republic and why I currently remain here as a fugitive. Anakin was surprised by what had just been revealed. So, what are you saying? He asked. The Jedi Knights, with all the incredible powers that you have, allowed the Galactic Senate to sidestep you, without doing anything. Just because you can do something, doesn't necessarily mean you should Anakin. Obi-Wan Kenobi explained. I did what I could within the limits of not abusing my own power. If the Senate chooses to no longer make use of the Jedi Knighthood, we cannot force them to do so. We need your guidance Obi-Wan. Padme Amidala added. Master Yoda told us to seek you out and you would show us the way. Obi-Wan smiled graciously to himself realizing, even far away across the galaxy, it was impossible to hide from his old master. The Imperial regime has already obtained codes that are capable of deactivating legions of battle droids. Said Bail Organa bluntly. Yes indeed, even droids have their limits. Obi-Wan agreed as he looked back at R2. I will help you of course. In another remote system of the galaxy, under the harsh rule of the Imperial regime, a commanding Grand Moff, several staunch military generals, and most importantly of all, an evil Dark Lord were discussing strategy plans, to strike at the Galactic Republic's governing core, the Coruscant system. The meeting was held on the jungle planet of Mofit, inside a great towering Imperial administration building, that oversaw the containment of thousands of slaves in a neighboring hard labor concentration camp. The camp was as widespread as a city and mercilessly exploited its inhabitants for the production of deadly Imperial war machines, and even worse, the growth of a highly skilled, unemotional clone trooper force. If we wait too long the Galactic Senate may resolve its discrepancies, increase its current military capacity and end our campaign. A commanding general said in a loud voice to make his point heard. There is no cause to worry about the Galactic Senate. The Dark Lord responded. We'll soon have the resources we need and soon the Coruscant system will be in our possession. As long as the Senate remains committed to the idea of activating the droid army, they are vulnerable. Grand Moff Tarkin said strong in his authority. He then stood up and pushed a button and a hologram representing the different systems throughout the galaxy, flashed from a projector in the center of the table before them. We will need to draw as many legions of the droid army away from the core systems as possible. Then taking the Coruscant system will be possible. What if the Senate becomes desperate enough and instead brings in the Jedi? The General put in. Another nodded his agreement. Yes exactly. They could destroy any attempt if. Leave them to me, the Dark Lord said, sounding like he already had a plan to deal with them. The Jedi are controlled by the Senate. Grand Moff Tarkin insisted. And as long as the Senate is satisfied that they can maintain power and be able to benefit from the conflict. They will not bring in the Jedi. And the Jedi are far too respectful in their long-standing accord with the Senate that they will not break it. Surely if we take Coruscant, the Jedi will attempt to take it back. Questioned one of the generals. That is why the Senate must be maintained. Grand Moff Tarkin responded. Its democracy will continue until it is no longer needed. Then, out of nowhere, a new voice entered the conversation. There will be only one opportunity, gentlemen. All the high-ranking officials turned their heads to watch a tall, pale, elegant lady stride sternly into the room. Without hesitation Grand Moff Tarkin stood up and offered her his chair. My queen. The rest of the officials followed and gave her a quick honoring bow. 
then sat down again as the queen took her place. She gazed upon the hologram with thoughts flowing through her mind. I have been in contact with Master Sidious, said the queen. He has foreseen our victory. Our valiant friend here, Darth Maul, and the rest of the Sith will be more than enough to take care of the Jedi, as long as you do your job commanders, we shall finally get what we have been waiting for, the rise of a galactic empire, completely under my rule. Grand Moff Tarkin looked hard at his fellow commanders. We shall not fail, we shall take Coruscant in one swift strike, then you my queen will be Empress. And the old Republic will finally be crushed. Indeed Tarkin, the Queen replied with a smile. I will. Chapter 6 In his trusty speeder, Anakin Skywalker, with his new-found friends, raced across the desert landscape. Soon they entered the small outpost of Anchorhead. Anakin drove them past the town's main dwellings, and before long, onto a section of farmland, containing a few roaming stock animals, and two solid concrete buildings. Well here we are, Anakin said to them. It's not much I know, but for me it's home. It's nice Anakin, Padme Amidala reassured him. Anyway come. Everybody followed Anakin into the larger structure. The building was as big as most sections of residential land. Inside revealed an enormous, perfectly circular, hole had been carved into the roof. It allowed plenty of natural light to seep down onto a very distinctive spaceship. This my friends is my pride and joy, the Star Hunter. Anakin announced with pride. You were right Anakin, she certainly is a sight to behold. Bail Organa said very impressed. What do you think R2? Padme asked the droid. Do you think it will take us to Naboo? R2-D2 whistled an affirmative. Soon the Star Hunter was loaded with supplies and ready for takeoff. R2-D2 had been plugged into the control console, to act as a co-pilot, as the others of the group strapped themselves into the chairs behind him. Anakin Skywalker manned the controls, and had the ship lift steadily through the hole above, until it was hovering with an amazing bird's eye point of view of Anchorhead. Then he proceeded to thrust the ship in a forward angle towards the higher atmosphere and into space. Are the coordinates ready? Anakin asked the droid. R2 tweeted back with confirmation it had. Okay everybody, get ready, brace yourselves. Anakin said as he flicked some switches and checked that his instruments were correct. 3, 2, 1. And it was at that exact moment the Star Hunter was thrust to light speed and entered the realm of hyperspace. Across the galaxy, on the planet Mofit, Imperial Guards stood watch, with large light torches to illuminate the darkness of night, that had descended upon the concentration camp. While below Imperial clone troopers patrolled its perimeter. Beyond the camp's outer barricades, a tiny patch of ground crumbled. Soon the soil beneath spurted out. At first a rather basic tool was seen shoving through the widening gap, and then, all of a sudden, a great furry arm flew up creating a sizable hole, big enough for an entire body to pull itself out. When the creature emerged, it could finally be seen for what it was, a Wookiee. Wookiees were strong, hairy, ape-like creatures in their appearance so tall, that they towered over most other species throughout the galaxy. At first the Wookiee tried to stay calm, carefully helping fellow captives escape when it thought the Imperial regime was not overlooking the area. But as time passed, panic set in and a small mob of Wookiees tried to pull the slaves through faster and faster. Eventually the inevitable happened, an emergency siren sounded loudly, all across the camp. The wail of the siren removed any last shreds of composure the captives had and desperately poured themselves into the surrounding jungle. Inside the walls of the concentration camp, clone troopers dashed to their speeders and launched the hunt to track each escapee down with their scanners. 
but what they failed to see was a mysterious woman, who, unnoticed, had held back and cautiously wandered around the facility to enter a transmission room. Within moments a large transmitting dish, atop of the building, became alive and a quick transmission was made. It wasn't long before slaves were being either round up or killed. The remaining escapees, made up of a variety of species, were eventually put in line and made to march back to the concentration camp. The next morning all the slaves throughout the entire camp were assembled in the wide open courtyard at the entrance. Before them were the surviving captives of the previous night. Standing over the entire ensemble, from a raised platform, was the evil Dark Lord, Darth Maul, and the Imperial Commandant Krizzle as their superiors sat quietly behind them. Last night was disappointing, very disappointing. And unnecessary. Commandant Krizzle began composed. One day there will be a time when you can all go home, go back to your planet of origin and I will be all but a distant memory. Though for right now, that time is yet to come. You see, thanks to those before you, we were forced to take action to stop these anarchists, these uncooperative and unintelligent beings. For we cannot afford to jeopardize the dream we have for a new, brighter future, a future with a galaxy united by order, and no longer dominated by crime and lawlessness. Here, beside me, is Lord Maul. He will show you what happens when order is not followed, and when our generous hospitality is ignored. He will ensure that, from this day on, that we have your full and utter cooperation. Commandant Krizzle looked into the eyes of the surviving escapees. He could see they were prepared to sacrifice themselves and had been so for a good while. Escapees, turn around and face your fellow workers. Show them the faces of those responsible. The escapees turned as instructed and stood before all the other captives. Darth Maul then stretched out his arm with an open hand and closed his eyes momentarily. When he reopened them, an evil scour poured over his face, as he felt the dark side of the force inside of him. Horror and dread littered the eyes of the escapees, through the eventual realization that they weren't the ones going to die, but instead were punished by being forced to watch their fellow captives get strangled to death. Hundreds of heroic beings all fell lifeless to the ground at once. Evil showed them no mercy. As Obi-Wan Kenobi cleaned a part of his disassembled lightsaber, aboard the Star Hunter, he felt a moment of very intense pain. The pain was not physical or mental, it was like the force that was radiating through him had been suddenly disrupted with an almighty jolt. Obi-Wan then closed his eyes and calmly positioned his body still. Short horrifying visions flashed through his mind. It was the past he saw, Obi-Wan immediately knew something truly obscene had taken place. Then a familiar voice echoed into his ears, Obi-Wan, why did you become a Jedi? Obi-Wan Kenobi opened his eyes to see a curious Anakin Skywalker before him and smiled. That's a very interesting question Anakin. Obi-Wan replied. You know when I was a small child, all I dreamed about was exploring the vast array of stars I saw every night. Obi-Wan then paused for a moment to recall. Like any orphan growing up, I longed for the day I could say goodbye to all the rules and regulations I had to follow and make my own way in the galaxy. You were an orphan? Anakin asked surprised. Yes, I was put in a home. I don't really remember my parents. I don't know how exactly I ended up in there. But it certainly didn't stop me from being a reckless tearaway, Obi-Wan said, as he began reminiscing. One day I had managed to find myself in a fight with a boy, a few years older than I was at the time. And in any normal circumstance he should have beaten me, beat the life out of me. But to my astonishment, when I prepared myself to push him away, the boy unexpectedly flew halfway across the room, without so much as the slightest touch from my hands. 
Obi-Wan paused as he gathered his thoughts, as you might imagine, everybody saw what had happened, saw with their very own eyes what I had done. And in the days following I became visited by a stoic Jedi Knight by the name of Ki Gon Jin. Immediately he sensed the force was very strong in me and proceeded to ask me how I felt leaving the orphanage and maybe, potentially, become a Jedi Knight. And you agreed. Anakin put in. Indeed. Obi-Wan Kenobi said simply, it was not long after that I found myself inside a Jedi temple under the scrutiny of a very old and very wise Jedi Master. Could you, could you teach me to become a Jedi Knight? Anakin interjected, changing the subject. Obi-Wan Kenobi hesitated for a moment. The question may have been straightforward, but its implications were enormous. While you have not shown any ability to use the Force, I can sense the Force is naturally very strong in you Anakin. You mean I already have the power? Anakin said, not expecting Obi-Wan's answer. Yes, and I can teach you to use it if you wish. Obi-Wan replied. But you must understand Anakin, being a Jedi Knight is not all about using the Force, it's a lifetime commitment to the better good. It is a lot of hard work and sacrifice. Something your parents may find difficult to accept, as well as yourself of course. Well to be honest I really only have my mother. Anakin said frankly, the Lars family are good people, don't get me wrong. They take good care of her, but I don't belong there. Tell me Anakin, if you don't mind my asking, who was your father? Obi-Wan asked, probing further. Anakin shook his head at the delicate question. His name was Byron. My mother told me little of what he actually did. But many times, she assured me, that he was a good man. Anakin replied in a reflective tone. I have always considered something terrible must have happened to him. That's why I think she came to Tatooine, to raise me, to escape and start a new life for us both. I am sorry to hear that. I know life can be difficult. Look there's no purpose for me back there. Anakin continued on. I don't want to live out my days stuck on some helpless rock. Suddenly a beeping noise radiated from the cockpit, grabbing Anakin's attention. It sounds like we're entering on Naboo. Chapter 7 The Star Hunter burst diligently into the Naboo system as Anakin Skywalker pulled the ship out of hyperspace. It then cruised toward the vibrant blue planet of Naboo. The Star Hunter rapidly descended into Naboo's crisp atmosphere and to its ultimate destination. Anakin checked the readings coming through on his ship's console. Strange, he mentioned. Plenty of structures but no strong life signals. You would think there would be an abundance of life down there. Obi-Wan periodically closed his eyes and used the Force. This planet was attacked, he said. Attacked, Bail Organa replied. Why would anyone attack Naboo? Padme Amidala asked. This is where I grew up. This planet is of no threat or strategic relevance to anyone. The planet is not what the attackers were interested in. More it was the enslavement of its people is what they were wanting. Said Obi-Wan. And probably thought the Republic wouldn't notice. Bail interjected. Anakin Skywalker responded far more sternly. Don't worry Padme they won't get away with it. Not long afterwards the Star Hunter made a graceful landing at its arrival coordinates, and its entry ramp folded out ready for its passengers to disembark. As Obi-Wan, Anakin, Padme, Bail and their R2 unit all exited the spaceship they were greeted by the sight of a grand palace, once the estate of the royal family of Naboo, and the welcoming presence of senators. As the group headed into the royal palace the main foyer was abound with senators in talks with other senators. Their entourages ensured their every whim was taken care of. 
In the center of the foyer, amongst all the incoherent chatter, a very highly polished gold protocol droid was bumbling around trying to attract attention. Excuse me sir, the droid kept repeating. Excuse me. Look go away, came back a response. We don't want you, go somewhere else. The droid quickly registered on R2-D2's sensor, and it raised his curiosity of why such a distinguished droid was being so unusually forward. It was not normal protocol and considering the circumstance, could be described as rather rude. Sir R2, being the inquisitive kind, made his way to find out. With a question sounded out in robotic beeps the golden protocol droid twisted its head towards the source of the noise and saw the little astromech before him. Well really. I didn't know an astromech droid could be quite as brazen as you are. The droid said surprised. Especially for one that I've never met before. R2-D2, rather bewildered that such a droid would refuse to answer his question, decided it best he introduced himself. Oh, I see R2-D2. Interpreted the protocol droid. And I am C-3PO, human-cyborg relations. I am servant to the royal family of Naboo. My master is none other than His Royal Highness, King Javan. An unsure R2-D2 bleeped back. Who is King Javan? said C-3PO amazed. You've never heard of him? Well I never. What is this galaxy coming to? The protocol droid then took a quick glance at his surroundings before continuing. I would introduce you to him, but he has seemed to have disappeared. In fact, I haven't seen a soul in such a long time I was beginning to wonder if I'd been disowned. R2 became fascinated by the droid, despite finding him a slight annoyance, he prodded him further. If my memory banks serve me accurately, this place was under quite a bit of turmoil before I was left behind. The protocol droid went on. My last order was to wait here for a transmission, which I'm glad to say has finally arrived. The astromech droid wondered what exactly the message was. I don't know, the protocol droid replied sternly. I am not some kind of makeshift utility droid. It's a recorded hologram and I am merely an interpreter. 3PO then refocused his visual senses to the crowd around them. Now if only I could get one of these busybodies to come with me, then maybe we could find out. R2-D2 suggested he should try. You, Squawk 3PO. Well I guess that is compute, come along then, I'll take you to the transmission post. With that R2-D2 happily unfolded down his third leg and followed in behind the bumbling protocol droid as they moved deeper into the depths of the palace. Eventually the droids arrived at the palace's transmission post. With C-3PO by his side, looking on, R2-D2 found a computer terminal. He extended his arm and started to twist his way into the machine's databank. Are you sure you know what you're doing? queried 3PO. The astromech beeped an affirmative. It only took R2-D2 a few moments more to check for the latest incoming transmissions. He downloaded what he'd initially set out to recover, and then curiously some more. Hey, you're not allowed to. I don't want to know about some hair-brained invasion you half-baked piece of metal. Quipped 3PO. Now stop that before someone. Before 3PO could end his sentence, R2-D2 had rotated his head and ignited a hologram from his projector. C-3PO then stepped back and watched in silence. The hologram depicted a woman whose face could not hide the fear that dominated her appearance. It was obvious that something very serious was burdening her. I don't have much time, the hologram spoke. We have been made prisoners in a concentration camp run by a military force, calling itself the Imperial Regime. I managed to activate and release a homing beacon before I was processed. Its frequency is 98835Z. 
Find help, get us out of here, oh no. All of a sudden the hologram dissolved. This is serious, said 3PO thinking aloud. We must help her. Chapter 8 Over in a large room, in another part of the palace, a meeting was underway. Padme sat next to Bail Organa in a circular row seating area that held a great many senators. In front Senator Palpatine, a very confident and dignified politician, was well launched into his appointed role as Speaker. As long as the Senate is tarnished with corruption, the galaxy remains vulnerable. Senator Palpatine announced. If war ever spread to the core systems, it will be unstoppable. We must put an end to this wretched terror now. Senator Palpatine looked hard at the senators before him. Who would like to go first? One senator stood up. We must convince the Jedi to change the minds of those supporting the clone army. The senator said. I've seen what the Jedi can do. They could easily exert their powers of influence. Well we do in fact have a representative for the Jedi here with us. Senator Palpatine replied. Obi-Wan Kenobi, we would be honored if you could enlighten us. Obi-Wan stood gracefully up among the senators. He carefully thought for a second before he began. Jedi principles disallow the force to be applied in such a blatant manner, the manner in which the senator has just described. Obi-Wan advised. If you want to remove this corruption, you must use the powers available to you to expose them. And once they are exposed, justice will prevail. Expose them, another senator interrupted. The trouble is we'll get discredited. The corruption is so widespread now that any unwise senator has enough support to stop an investigation taking place, let alone be brought to justice. There is simply no way you are going to remove every underhanded representative from the Senate. Kenobi listened intently. What the senator said was true, there was no easy means of changing the situation. I understand your position, Senator, said Obi-Wan Kenobi calmly. I myself tried to expose the corruption and bring about justice and was, as you say, vilified and discredited, to the point where I am now forced into hiding. Obi-Wan paused for a moment and gave a reflective smile. At any means I still believe there is hope. The Jedi Knighthood may be largely ignored by the Galactic Senate. But democracy still survives. Well that's not good enough. Another senator responded. We must do something. As Obi-Wan Kenobi sat back down he could feel tensions rise. Voices began to echo in the chamber as Obi-Wan's reasoning was rejected. Senator Palpatine could also see that the meeting was quickly disintegrating before his eyes and seized the opportunity. Gentlemen, gentlemen, Senator Palpatine called. When the room quieted, he continued. Our only option then, is to form an alliance between us, and confront this problem head on. It is my intention to replace the current governing body of the Senate. If you are willing to support my bid, to overthrow the current incompetent Chancellor, I am willing to promise that I will put an end to this corruption, this frivolous terror, and ensure that we no longer have to put up with the horrendous devastation, left behind, on planets, such as this. Senator Palpatine was then quickly met with an eruptive applause. Padme. Came a call as Padme Amidala walked with Senator Palpatine and Bail Organa away from the meeting room. They all stopped as Anakin swiftly caught up with them. How did it go? I think we could call it a success. Responded Padme. Are you brought your servant? Senator Palpatine said speculating. Anakin was caught somewhat off guard with the senator's words. The senator's assumption was the sort of condemning comment that reflected his long years of service as a politician. Senator Palpatine, this is Anakin Skywalker. Bail Organa replied. And he's certainly not a servant, but one of the best pilots this side of the galaxy, and a true hero. 
For a brief moment Senator Palpatine studied Anakin. Of course, yes, Anakin. I'm honored to have your presence among us. Palpatine said opening to a smile. I can see you would definitely make a perfect star pilot for our new alliance. Anakin didn't know what to say to Palpatine. He realized he really was a fish out of water. Where's Obi-Wan? Anakin asked. He, Padam's attention was suddenly shifted as she noticed R2-D2 coming towards them with a peculiar droid she had never met before. He said he had something to attend to. These droids told me they found a message, he needs to see it. It took Anakin just a little while to find Obi-Wan Kenobi sitting and contemplating amongst what was the palace's courtyard. He stroked his ruffling beard, seemingly staring into space. Obi-Wan, said Anakin, trying to gain Obi-Wan's attention. What's wrong? Obi-Wan looked up at Anakin with concern. If only I knew Anakin, there is some kind of evil presence among us. Anakin looked at his surroundings. Are you sure? Yes, I can feel the veil of the dark side of the Force, something terrible has happened here. I have seen the visions. The dark side. I don't understand, said Anakin as he sat next to his mentor. Well you could say the Force is made up by two opposing sides, the light and the dark. Obi-Wan explained. And everything in this galaxy is either being drawn towards one or the other. In the natural world it remains constantly in balance. But since our knowledge has evolved to the point where we now have the ability to use the Force for our own ends, we can be seduced by the wrong path, if we do not choose wisely. You think there is someone like that here, on this planet? It's very unlikely, thought Obi-Wan Kenobi. There hasn't been that kind of problem since, oh centuries ago, when my old master helped eliminate the last of the Sith. The Sith. Oh, the Sith were once a brutal, twisted, maniacal order, that welded its power from the dark side. Obi-Wan said bluntly. They brought nothing but terror and oppression upon this galaxy, and that is precisely why such a thing must never happen again. Then come with me, there is something I think you should cast your eyes on. Obi-Wan Kenobi then looked back at Anakin very intrigued. Later, back on board the Star Hunter, R2-D2 was in the middle of replaying the hologram to all that had become his faithful companions, along with the very gracious Senator Palpatine. Find help, get us out of here, oh no. Hearing the end of the message Obi-Wan Kenobi shook his head, as he knew this was in direct connection to the visions he had experienced earlier. This is potentially very dangerous, Obi-Wan Kenobi told his friends. We must be cautious if there are to be any survivors left after any attempt at a rescue. Cautious. Anakin bit back. What do you mean we need to be? What we need Anakin is to try and carefully draw their captors out. Otherwise we may not stop further genocide from happening. Or even worse end up being destroyed ourselves. It was obvious from Obi-Wan's response, that he already knew what should be done. Would you be willing to lead such a rescue? Bail Organa asked him. I myself cannot offer much, Alderaan is small, but its resources are at your disposal. I can provide a solid ground force and starships. Padme Amidala added. And I, Obi-Wan, can provide you with the reliable intelligence you need. Senator Palpatine said with a grin. Obi-Wan Kenobi looked back at them humbly. Then I hope your faith in me is well rewarded. He said. I just fear we may be too late. Across the galaxy, in the concentration camp, the evil Sith Darth Maul knelt onto a raised platform to ignite a hologram to begin a live transmission. Before him was an image of a man with a hood extending far enough to make his face indistinguishable. This was Master Sidious, Lord Maul's dark mentor. There has been a disturbance in the Force, Master Sidious began. 
Obi-Wan Kenobi has re-emerged with a new apprentice. Anakin Skywalker. What do you wish of me, Master Sidious? I have foreseen Obi-Wan's demise. He and his pitiful army will attempt to destroy our Imperial base. But I have a plan. Master Sidious replied unnerved. It will bring Obi-Wan Kenobi and his companions straight to you, my friend. You must be ready. You must wipe them out, all of them. Darth Maul looked back with menace. At last we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last we will have our revenge. Chapter 9 Obi-Wan Kenobi walked into the conference chamber with a lot on his mind. He was aboard the Tantive IV, Bail Organa's flagship, a Corellian corvette that he had personally modified. The vessel was of little use for attack purposes, but with its strong shielding capabilities and swift speed, it was ideal as a command ship. Ah, General Kenobi, said a captain sitting at a table with other officers. I am Captain Antilles. Myself, along with these fine officers, are ready and at your disposal. Please take a seat. It was unusual for Obi-Wan Kenobi to think of himself of as a general. While this concoction of a fleet was by no means a proper military, it was necessary for it to function like one. And as Obi-Wan moved into his position at the head of the table, he had to act accordingly. What's the report? Obi-Wan inquired. Sir, we have pinpointed the transmission, it was made from the planet of Mofit. An officer said as he brought up a hologram, depicting the planet, in the center of the table. Its high vegetation makes it difficult for any pilot to openly view the targets, without a targeting computer. The planet is not inhabited by any galactic cultures. Any existing life outside of the target areas will be primitive in nature. Bombing therefore will not be a cause for concern. It is of the deepest concern, Obi-Wan said addressing the officer's poor observation. Continued. We have no quantifiable data of where any of the targets will be, if prisoners are still alive there, or what military resources have been planted for the planet's defense. In other words, General Kenobi, another officer said interrupting. This is the worst hodgepodge mission any self-respecting officer can be a part of. I wouldn't be too hasty, the force is with us. Obi-Wan replied. It is obvious that these captors, whoever they are, do not wish to give up their prisoners. They will come out and attack. And if your fighters can hold them off long enough, that I can free the slaves and get them to the transports. We will be successful. Obi-Wan could still sense some disbelief in his officers. You will die before you free the prisoners. Obi-Wan smiled. I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss my abilities. He said knowingly. A fully-fledged Jedi Knight is more than a match for any army. It is they who are at a disadvantage. Close by, standing alone in his assigned quarters aboard a carrier, Anakin Skywalker finished putting on his pilot's suit. It was a good fit. He pulled at the sleeve to check it wasn't too loose. It wasn't, he was ready. Though that was a relative term, for how could someone, with only a few days of fighter training really ever be ready? Then Anakin heard a voice behind him, it was Padme. Are you decent? She asked light-heartedly. May we come in? Don't worry, come through. Padme walked in with R2-D2 in tow. You look very swish. Padme remarked. You think it'll do? Anakin asked. I think so, and R2-D2 agrees. Don't you R2? R2 gave back a series of positive tweets and whistles as he rotated his head. We've got less than three hours to our destination. I just wanted to be sure you're okay Anakin. If you don't want to go. Oh, I want to go. I have to go, Anakin insisted. Obi-Wan has shown me that with my strong affinity with the Force, I can make a real difference. He has a lot of faith in you Anakin, Padme said. 
we all do. And if you feel you are ready, we will be behind you. I just wanted to be sure. After all, it's not every day I get to see such an attractive young man in action. Anakin couldn't help but blush as he smiled at her comment. I guess not, he said a little awkwardly. Anyway, with our trust in the Force I'm sure all will go well. I have no doubt it will Anakin. In the surrounding space orbiting the planet of Mofit, the Alliance's mate Du Fleet pulled out of hyperspace, and straight away the Tantive Four flew onward with four starfighters moving in to escort it. It was a highly irregular move for a command ship, even with its escort, the ship looked vulnerable. But that was the point, for what better way to bring out a force of enemy ships than an easy target? Any signs of life down there? Obi-Wan Kenobi asked the controller as he stood looking out towards the distant planet. Yes, but I can't confirm your target. The controller replied. We are blind. I'm not sure I will be able to pinpoint it in time. Have no fear, Obi-Wan said. I will guide you. In its approach the Tantive Four made its course set from Obi-Wan Kenobi's deductions. It descended down, as far as it could go without breaching the planet's atmosphere. In that moment a group of hexagon-looking fighters came towards them. Then suddenly an escape pod was jettisoned beneath the Tantive Four, and the ship's engines lit up, with full thrust, as it endeavored to evade its pursuers. And to the relief of the Alliance it did. Sir it looks as though the enemy fighters have returned to base. Bail Organa looked no less relieved. Stay sharp, he said. In an open area of hilly surroundings, the escape pod had landed on Mofit in one piece. Obi-Wan had endured the terrifying experience of freefall and managed to leave the awful contraption with pretty much all his faculties intact. He had moved, atop to one of the high points of a hill and got out a pair of macro binoculars. As Obi-Wan steered through the viewfinder, he could see all the giveaway details of a concentration camp. Red lasers flowed all around the perimeter, that were encased by guard posts and enormously thick, high walls. Obviously, there wasn't any easy way in or out. Obi-Wan then focused in on the inhabitants, the large number of prisoners and the surprising low number of guards. It would seem his chance to free those captured was better than what he had expected. Suddenly Obi-Wan felt a disturbance, right as he put the macro binoculars down, and turned towards it. He had little time to react. Obi-Wan instinctively flipped back, as a lightsaber swung like a boomerang towards him. It missed. Obi-Wan drew out his own lightsaber as he scanned the area. Then a voice made his head turn. For too long has the Sith hidden in waiting. For too long has the galaxy been held back from its rightful masters. Now Jedi, you will die. With vengeance Darth Maul attacked. His actions were unrelenting with ferocity. But with every strike Obi-Wan Kenobi's use of the Force guided him to defend and prevent the Sith from overwhelming him. You won't kill me, Obi-Wan insisted. The galaxy is quite safe from you and your kind. The Sith gave a slightly smug laugh in return, as though Obi-Wan's comment was nothing but pure naivety. The age of the Jedi Knights is coming to an end. Jedi by Jedi. Well they're not buying it. One of the officers on board the Tantive Four said openly. Anybody with a plan B. The comment came as an anxious command room was trying not to obsess over the fact that nothing was happening. And the question on everybody's mind was how much longer should they wait? What we need is more information. Another officer stated. We have to confirm. It was in that very moment the Alliance's fleet became instantly surrounded by the Imperial regime's heavily armed navy. More than four Imperial Star Carriers burst out of hyperspace and together released a swarm of TIE Fighters. 
Then as Anakin Skywalker was standing by his assigned star fighter, he heard an urgent call from command. All squadrons code blue. All squadrons code blue. Anakin, along with all his fellow pilots, scrambled up to their cockpits. Noises of the ship's hull being blasted by enemy lasers vibrated throughout the hangar. The pilots got into their positions. Then Anakin tried to focus himself and remember Obi-Wan's advice, about letting go and trusting in the Force. With the push of a button he closed the cockpit entrance, and then started flicking switches and pushing more buttons to get the craft ready for takeoff. In a matter of moments, the craft was hovering with the landing pads raised. Here goes nothing, he said. As Anakin thrust his way into space and saw the huge number of TIE fighters, he knew this wasn't going to be any sort of strategic attack. This was about survival. All squadrons, this is Commander Flint. I want squadrons yellow and green to concentrate on these large carriers. All other squadrons get rid of as many of these fighters as you can, good luck. The battle was fierce. Looking at the number of enemy ships, the Alliance was almost swamped. Even if they survived it surely seemed it would be wiped from existence. 507, oh, are you receiving? 507, oh, are you there? A voice sounded on Anakin's receiver while he blasted a TIE fighter into smithereens. Bail. Bail Organa, said Anakin as he recognized who it was. Anakin what we've got ourselves into is a death trap. Bale responded bluntly. I am going to go for Obi-Wan Kenobi. Can you provide some protection and keep these fighters away long enough, so I can make a run? Go ahead. Get that ship out of there. Anakin then switched channels. Pilots 4, 9, 2 to 5, 0, 9, this is 5, 0, 7 come with me. The Tantive Four is going to make a break for it and requires assistance. What's going on 507? A voice asked back. Possibly our only hope. Chapter 10 The hatred that Darth Maul had, for the Jedi Knights, could be felt with every clash of his lightsaber's blade. The fight took many twists and turns, as each side struggled to obtain dominance over the other. Both men were physically fit, strong and very agile. It was possible the match would come down to stamina, and the strength of the determination. Every time Obi-Wan Kenobi pushed Darth Maul back with the Force, he would counteract it with his own dark side abilities. Then Obi-Wan made a mistake, for a brief second his concentration lapsed, and he found himself raised from the ground choking without his weapon. Darth Maul walked towards him and picked up the fallen lightsaber. The victory is mine, said Darth Maul. I almost feel a sense of pity. It seems a waste to kill such talent, you would serve the dark side well. There will be a time you know, you will regret what you have done. The Sith looked bemused, maybe, but not today. Darth Maul raised his lightsaber, and as he did, a loud sound vibrated through the air. For the briefest moment the Sith turned his attention to the noise. Obi-Wan Kenobi seized the opportunity and reacted with a force push. Darth Maul stumbled, which allowed Obi-Wan to throw away the Sith's weapon and grab back his own lightsaber. Within seconds the saber's blade ignited. Obi-Wan jumped and dismembered Darth Maul with a few precise strokes. And as he lay there, helpless, Obi-Wan smiled at the sight of the Tantive Four. You see that is the greatest force of all, having friends by your side. Darth Maul squirmed, wriggling his body in the realization he no longer had any limbs. Obi-Wan Kenobi had to consider the sad decision. Should he let him live? Or should he let him die? Obi-Wan walked over and pointed the blade of his lightsaber at the Sith's head. 
Hum, what to do with you? The Tantive Four moved down to hover by Obi-Wan Kenobi's side. Obi-Wan remained where he was for just a moment, as thoughts buzzed through his mind. He knew there was no doubt that the Sith were astronomically dangerous, but ending his life was maybe short-sighted. Surely it was possible, if not certain, that there were more Sith somewhere else in the galaxy. And what if the Sith could be saved and turned to the light? After all his life was worth something, wasn't it? It was. For that was the Jedi way, the fundamental ideal that life was worth fighting for, all life. Obi-Wan Kenobi then shifted his glance towards an entranceway opening up on the side of the Tantive Four. Take my advice, don't go anywhere. From there Obi-Wan leaped into the Tantive Four and was met by Bail Organa. Sorry Obi-Wan, I know we're not exactly going to plan here, but we are desperate. You must come. The Tantive Four headed the way in which it came. Inside the cockpit Obi-Wan Kenobi stood himself before the viewing window, with Captain Antilles and his crew manning the controls. One of the Alliance's frigates exploded in the distance. There goes another one, said one of the front controllers. Keep course, replied Captain Antilles. Obi-Wan Kenobi went into full concentration, as he spread his hands forward and closed his eyes. He may have been left weak after his duel, but the Force was with him. Then when Obi-Wan could sense all the different components of the space battle in his mind, he started trembling. He used the Force to reach out, surround each enemy fighter in an energy field and enclose them, dragging them to an eventual stop. Hey, said one of the Alliance's star pilots taking notice. What's going on here? They're incapacitated, said another. All squadrons, repeat, all squadrons. Destroy all enemy craft. It was only a short period of time later that the battle ended. Obi-Wan was relieved and Bail Organa gave him a friendly pat on the back. Chapter 11 Following the triumph of victory, Bail Organa, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Captain Antilles, Anakin Skywalker and the handful of soldiers that joined them, finally entered the concentration camp. But when they saw the unpleasant remains, it was a somber reaction. Whoever is responsible for all this will be found and be made to suffer, every last one of them. Said Anakin expressing his thoughts aloud. No one will do any such thing Anakin. Obi-Wan responded abruptly. There is already enough suffering in this galaxy. We have been tasked to end it, not increase it. Suddenly they heard a voice of one of the soldiers calling out. Sir, one of the prisoners is still alive. Obi-Wan knelt down to the prisoner's side, extended his arm and let the force flow from his hands. You've suffered an awful lot, my friend. But you'll be okay, he said. What is your name? The young man, pale and weak, looked back at Obi-Wan. Jan Dodonna, he replied. We were the ones who refused to cooperate. So they executed us and took the others. It became clear to Obi-Wan Kenobi that whoever was behind all this knew they were coming. The Sith were waiting for them. Where to from here General Kenobi? Asked Captain Antilles. There is more going on here than what we realize. And until we know the total extent of it, we dare not make another unprecedented move. Or next time we may not be so lucky. What about this Sith? That is not a concern for the Alliance, Captain. Said Obi-Wan Kenobi. He will soon be captured and placed under Jedi supervision. Later the remaining fleet of the Alliance had regrouped on Naboo. Padme Amidala was joyous in seeing them back again, and in one piece. She squeezed them tight with the hardest of hugs as they entered the palace. You're back, she cried. 
Not everybody unfortunately, said Obi-Wan on reflection. So, I heard. I was absolutely devastated when I was told of the news. I feared for the return of any survivors. Padme explained as she walked with them. What you did was extraordinarily brave Obi-Wan. You all were. In one of the grand halls inside the royal palace, ceremonious music filled the air. Sitting at either side was a large crowd showing their proud honor of being present in the company of heroes. Obi-Wan waited alongside Anakin Skywalker and Bail Organa who were the last in waiting to walk up the aisle, between the seas of people. And as Obi-Wan stood humbly, he couldn't help but consider his concern of what his leadership had brought. For he felt he should have done better, despite his lengthy search, the Sith Lord had somehow managed to escape him. And apart from saving one or two survivors, the mission was a failure. Before the group knew it, they were walking with conviction up to the mantle. There Padme Amidala smiled upon each of them and then laid, around their necks, a medal, representing their dedication, sacrifice and courage. Seeing his awarded medal, Obi-Wan had mixed feelings if he deserved it. But his face lit up from looking at the beautiful object, his mind finally recognized that it was not about the making of any mistakes, or what anyone's expectations were. The Alliance was born from a desire to keep the galaxy safe, and free from the evils of exploitation and corruption, whatever the risks. It was a noble cause worth putting your life on the line for, and a cause that he would passionately pursue from now on. Because deep in Obi-Wan's heart he could feel that they were on the side of light. He knew the Force would be with them, always.